would like the world to know that I had a life before and after the world. <laughs> <laughs> and I would frankly like to forget the whole thing. <laughs> And I'd like to thank the uh, <coughs> House Committee for inviting me back to Los Angeles. It's been wonderful and I've enjoyed the talk so much. And I'd like to thank Harry Thomas and his family for billeting me so graciously in their home in, in Los Angeles. And then, I guess I'm stuck with giving a talk. <laughs> I, um, I met Mama in 52, 56, 58, and 62. And uh, I did not get to go to the Mensa House of 54, but that's a whole story, another story. And it's been my experience that, um, <laughs> even though I've told it a few hundred times, um, that most people seem to be the most interested in how one comes to Baba. And in my case, well, their curiosity is justified because I'm the most unlikely candidate I can think of. <laughs> because <clears throat> I was born on a dirt farm in Texas five or six years ago. And, uh, <laughs> uh, there was not, <clears throat> and that is actually the Bible Belt, which uh, I hope is disappearing, but it's not fast enough. Uh, my, uh, my father broke a line of Methodist preachers, if you're ready. He had, I think, five or six generations before him. And um, I remember as a child, we had revival meetings, which are, Ugh. <laughs> now that's a circus if you haven't seen it. But uh, my mother used to play piano for the <clears throat> revival meetings, and I was the youngest child, and I had to sit in the front pew all by myself because nobody else sat there, and so she could keep an eye on me. And, um, Oh, I, you know these rat, ranting and raving preachers. But anyway, that was my spiritual background. And um, it happened, then we moved to the city. And uh, when I was around eight, I don't know exactly what prompted it, but I came home one day and announced to my parents that I was not going to go to church anymore. And they said, oh? And uh, why not? And I don't remember exactly what I said, but I have an impression that somehow or other the hypocrisy of the church did not appeal to me. And my father, a wonderful gentleman, said, well, all right, you don't have to go to church, but don't get any smart ideas on how you behave. So, okay. So I grew up <coughs> a misfit. <laughs> I won't say outcast, but a misfit in my society because Somewhere along the line, and this is really, I mean, I don't usually do this kind of, say this kind of thing, but I tell this because I really think that this was Baba's finger from the very beginning. Somewhere along the line, I decided I wanted to be a dancer. <laughs> you can picture a farmer, or, you know, I would, and by that time I had a newspaper route and so forth and so and then, and not only that, I wanted to be a ballet dancer. Well, I had never seen ballet. So I do not know where that came from. But there were a couple of books in the local library, <laughs> which maybe had 50 or 60 altogether. Um, <laughs> but, <clears throat> and uh, somewhere along the line, I learned that you had to be very young to start uh, a ballet, to be a ballet dancer. And by this time, I was a teenager and realized, well, that wasn't very practical. So I thought, well, I'll be an, I'll be an actor. Uh, anything to get away from Canyon, Texas. And uh, it was something like that. Not that my childhood was a brutal or unhappy or any, uh, you know, more than the one difficulty or another that everybody goes through. But I just wanted to get away from there and in a wider world. And. Um, so when I graduated from high school, the summer that I graduated from high school, uh, I met a woman from Albany, New York, who had two daughters. And uh, the, she was down in Texas to visit these two, one of these two daughters. And these two daughters had gone into show business. 
And uh, I mean, it wasn't big time or anything like that, but uh, it was show business. Well, I was enthralled in Gaga, and I confided in her my secret passion that I wanted to be a dancer. And that I knew I never could be, and so forth and so on. That's what I really wanted. She said, well, I've heard about this place up in, in the Berkshires, uh, in Massachusetts, and it's a summer festival, and they have a school. And uh, it's quite famous, as indeed it really was. It was Jacob's Pillow. And um, in the dance world, Jacob's Pillow is a very well-known name. I mean, it's a household name. Uh, Ted Sean founded it up in the Berkshire, and Ruth St. Dennis was up there, and so forth and so on. So anyway, she said, when I go back, I'll get some information about it, and uh, <clears throat> I'll send it to you. So she did. And um, it turned out that they offered, you know, in very fine print, a few scholarships are available. And since I had no money, uh, I uh, decided, I wrote to them, and... Uh, I told them that I didn't know, uh, I had no training, and did not know that I had talent, but I was willing to work, and that more than anything in the world, I wanted to come to Jacob's Pillow to study dancing. Well, lo and behold, wow. I got that stuff. <laughs> so if that's not Bob's hand. <laughs> and so I went. And, um, Boy, I said I was willing to work, well I really did, because there were four scholarships boys, and three of them were already dancers. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, I grew up on a farm and in a cleaning shop and so forth, I really did know how to work. And I thought, so forth, everybody did, but that's not true. And certainly if you don't feel that you should work, uh, and they didn't, <laughs> well, I was doing everybody's work. But that's all, that's perfectly all right. I feel you, know, you pay your way one way or the other. And uh, as it happened, uh, that particular summer, uh, Valley Theater, uh, it is now called American Valley Theater, but it was just Valley Theater in there, was in residence. Uh, part of the company was in residence up there at Chambers Pillow. And uh, their new ballet mistress from England was coming to Jacob's Pillow to teach. Now, this ballet mistress's name was Marguerite Krask. And Miss Krask had come, this was 1947. Miss Krask had come from India, I believe, in December. She came to England in December of uh, 1946. Now, you historians, you are free to correct me. I may give you an argument, but you're still free to correct me. Um, she came in December of 1946, and I met her in June of 1947. So she was rather fresh from Baba. Well, what can I tell you? I fell madly and hopelessly in love with this lady. Uh, I mean, some of you who have met her, well, that won't be hard to understand. But you, you don't... I doubt if any of you really know what a hick is. They've disappeared. But... Back then, mind you, I grew up in the 30s, and um, there was no television, there was no, you know, and we didn't have a radio, and um, uh, I didn't see a movie, I think, until I was about 12. And um, so, I mean, I really was a hick. And uh, here is this refined culture, magical, witty English lady. And boy, if that doesn't trick you, nothing will. <laughs> and uh, she was actually my first ballet teacher. So I was pretty much in luck. And uh, that summer, the news went around that this woman was a uh, weird, that she, maybe she was yogi, she used to sit up on a mountain and pull gauze through her nose or whatever they could do. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, uh, well, I didn't care what anybody said about her. But anyway, it turned out that uh, a few people uh, did inquire about uh, Baba. Uh, one of them is Ella uh, Marx, who was Ella Massey then. Some of you may know her. And uh, I still am friends with Ella, whom I met there that summer in 1947. And it's very strange that Ella and I met Miss Kraska in 1947 and became interested in Baba. And 
We were the two that were with her when she died, which was purely coincidental. Uh, and yet there were two other uh, dancers, uh, Ed Hankel and Sylvia Nolan, and they came down when Miss Crafts was very ill. And uh, there was uh, Ed and Sylvia and Ella and me. And someone else, Catherine Horn, said, oh, the youngest and the oldest. And it turned out that they were her, her contemporary pupils, and we were the old, old ones. But anyway, so okay. Well, um, uh, that summer ended. Some people did ask about Bob, and uh, I believe Bob was one, was one of them. And uh, uh, that summer ended, and Miss Crask went to a tour with Valley Theater, and uh, I was offered a scholarship by another teacher in New York City, and uh, <clears throat> I broke my parents' heart for the first time really badly when uh, <clears throat> I had <clears throat> announced to them that I was not going to college because they came from a very uh, humble background and had slaved their entire lives, and uh, their one goal in life was to have their children graduate from college, and I had a scholarship, and I turned it down. The company would come in, and uh, those of us from the pillow who had gone to uh, New York, Ellen, Rosemary, and all these people, um, uh, we would call her up. She stayed at the Woodward Hotel, I remember so well, and uh, she would have uh, lunch with us or dinner with us, which, looking back on it, was so amazing. I mean, we were so, we must have been the bores of the world, and yet there she was. Because I learned out much, much later that Baba, when Miss Crask, who did not really enjoy being in India <laughs> at all, uh, those whole seven years, she loved Baba and she wanted to be with Baba, but she didn't want to be in India. <laughs> which to me is the easiest thing in the world to understand. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but anyway, when she left India, Baba told her, said, go out into the world and teach dancing and spread my word. And that's what she did. And she tolerated one idiot after another uh, for years and years and years. And she taught until she was 93. Oh, wow. And even then, everybody had to put pressure on her and make her stop. I mean, she had got money and her health was failing and so forth, and lots of disastrous things, and finally she did give it up. But um, uh, she made love of explicit, you know, implicitly. Explicitly? Yeah. Well, yeah. Right. <laughs> All the way. So, um, okay, time passed, and uh, I got a job at the Metropolitan Opera. And uh, she was, by that time, uh, an associate director of the school of the Met. And uh, all these years, you know, from 1947, it was now getting along to be around 1952. And um, I had been to dinner with her and luncheon with her, and I adored her more and more and more all the time. I mean, mind you, I was completely intimidated by her. and. Uh, People always laugh because I still call, well, till the day I die, I will call her Miss Crask. I have no trouble calling Elizabeth Elizabeth and Kitty Kitty and Dee and Dee, but never, I will never have the nerve to call her Margaret. <laughs> and uh, because I was her, her pupil. And um, so all these years that I had been going out to lunch and dinner with her, and we became, became friends as well. And um, I had heard these stories about Baba. I mean, I remember that Ella Matt, Marx and I were on the street one day, and it was right across the corner, right across the street from Carnegie Hall, and we met Miss Crask on the corner, and um, uh, and she greeted us and everything like that. And she looked at Ella and she said, which was news to me. She said, "When are you going to come to me and talk to me about Baba?" Again. And Ella, who was courtesy itself, well, Miss Crass, I'm good, isn't that good? And so Miss Crass sort of chuckled and she looked at me very and said, You know, uh, Ella doesn't quite know what to make of Baba. <laughs> <laughs> and she changed and these two eyes, she said, What do you make of him? 
Well, she could, uh, I couldn't have been more shocked if she had slapped me. And I went, oh, 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 oh. and she laughed and she said, well, you better come and speak to me. Well, that was, oh, if I could have chosen, chosen the ten most unsavory things in my life, I wouldn't want to do that would be at the top of the list. I did, and uh, I, anyway, it, that was very, very difficult for me, painful. I worked up, and yet I respected her and loved her so much that I felt that if she asked me that I had to go, well, uh, I went through torture, uh, because I didn't want anything to do with that, with that kind of thing, somehow or other. And yet I went, and she was charmed as stuff. She could charm the skin off a snake without even trying. Ah, she smiled at you. And she told me stories of Baba. She told me, um, the only thing I know about Baba and the philosophy and so forth and so on, I learned through the stories that this past told me to this day. I mean, when I went to her, I mean, being a very uh, superior intellect, I said, oh, well, what have you got to read? And she said, oh, no, my lad. You're in enough of a level as it is. You're not going to get to me to read. And uh, so she wouldn't let me read for about seven years. <laughs> and at the end of seven years, she said, oh, you're always asking for something to read. So she went into one of her drawers and she fumbled around. And she came out with a little thing about this big. <laughs> and it had seven pages. And it had seven basic realities. And she said, that should hold you for this lifetime. <laughs> And, uh, and so it is. And um, uh, to this day, and she gave me murder mysteries to read because that's what Papa gave her. And um, to this day, I cannot read. I mean, I've tried to get through God's speech. I've really tried. Really tried. Uh, no way. I read 10 pages and I stop and I say, what have I read? <laughs> Not one word. Not one word. That happens to me time and time and time and time again. But there was, I went far enough at one point that, I don't know, page 269 or something like that, where he says, I am only writing this to still the convulsions of your mind. And I figured, well, oh, it's not so bad after all. <laughs> so I can't. So there we go. But anyway, came 1952, and I had been seduced by Miss Crest. And um, then Baba was coming to America. And all of a sudden, boy, I dug in my heel. Now, wait a minute. I mean, all these marvelous stories she told me, I thought, you know, that was ancient history. And colorful and amusing and interesting and beautiful they were. But I thought that was all over and done with. And uh, so and then he comes and he's coming to America. Well, I go through the whole thing over again, worse, that I did not want to come. Boy, did I not want to come. But, okay, I, you know, my love and respect for Miss Crest once again came to the fore that I felt that even though I had no feeling at all about it, of which I was aware in any way, I said, you have to go. I mean, what kind of a slob are you? And I didn't want the answer to that. <laughs> so I, I uh, uh, decided, well, I will. And by that time, there were three young women, uh, Zebra and uh, Sura and Skipper, uh, who were also in the Met at the time, dancers. And they had become interested in Baba. And uh, as it would happen, uh, we would be on tour with the vet when Baba was seeing people at Myrtle Beach on which day, don't ask me, I'm a terrible historian, but on one particular day, we were free to see him. He was meeting people for the first time. Now, on that particular day, which I will say was a Saturday, I don't know, I think about it, but don't, you know, don't get upset. And don't write it down. <laughs> Okay, and uh, we would be in Minneapolis 
And there was a, a, a contractual agreement at that time that if you were on tour with a company, you were not free to go with beyond a radius of 50 miles of wherever the company was playing. Well, the Myrtle Beach was more than, further, more than 50 miles. So the only thing to do was to get permission to go. But before we got commit permission, we had to do this all sort of in a rush deal. And Bunty Kelly, who was not uh, in the Met at that time, was our liaison in New York, and she was doing research as to you know, how to get to. Now, Myrtle Beach in those days was a far cry from what it is now. First of all, it was uh, very beautiful. I mean, between Myrtle Beach proper and the center, there was nothing but open land, beautiful. I mean, you know, and uh, Myrtle Beach <laughs> did not have an airport, and uh, there was no place to get, no way to get there, that's all. The only way we could possibly go was to hire a plane. <laughs> now, you've got four gypsies, four dancers, who, we don't make all that money, much money, certainly, and we never did, but um, uh, for us to hire a plane was uh, quite an endeavor, quite an undertaking, but we managed to do that. We hired some company out of Chicago who hired out private planes, and we had to put down a deposit of $800, which was a fortune to us in those days. I mean, not so little now to me, but uh, it was like worth five or six times that. And it was unredeemable. Uh, you couldn't get it back. So we did that because that took time. And so we covered ourselves there that we could put down that money and we would have this plane reserved for that particular day. Then we had to go through getting permission to leave the company long enough to go see Baba. Well, I knew that Miss Crass would um, want us to do it in a proper way. Therefore, we could not go, we didn't dare go over anybody's head. We had to go through. And the, the Metropolitan Opera, the Opera Company on tour was a pretty big organization. So the, we went to our immediate superior, which uh, was our choreographer and ballet director, and asked and told him, and he knew Miss Crask, and he even knew about Baba. But he said, well, you can't go. Don't, I'm not taking that on. You can't go. And so we, and then we decided, well, we would go to the assistant stage manager. Well, we went away. Well, we didn't even finish the sentence. He said, yeah, get out of here. You can't go. And so then we went to the production stage manager, and then to the tour manager. And finally, we got to the assistant general manager. And everybody said, without qualification, no, you cannot go. So the only one left was a man named Rudolph Bing, who at that time was almost a household name. He was an extremely famous man who had uh, directed the Glyndebourne Festival and was now the general director of the Metropolitan Opera. Well, we were frantic. We didn't really know what we were going to do. And, um, and then came a particular Sunday, and we didn't have, we were in Minneapolis already, and um, for some reason or other, the girls decided they wanted to get dressed up. You know, when you're on tour, you're in blue jeans and this and that and the other for you know, months on end and so forth, and they decided they wanted to be, you know, fetching. So, uh, they, the company kept our wardrobe fronts. We carried our hand luggage, and the company carried our wardrobe. So we went to the theater. It was a matinee with probably out of that So I didn't have anything, but they decided they wanted to get dressed up. And mind you, these were three lookers. Zebra looked a lot like Mayra. Uh, she didn't have as beautiful a heart face shape, uh, heart shaped face, heart face shape, heart shaped face as Mayra did. But she was dark, and she parted her hair, and she was very beautiful. And Sura was a tall, kind of Greek, statuesque, blonde, with beautiful high cheekbones. And, and Skipper was, um, had gorgeous skin. She grew up in Seattle. She never saw the sun. So, um, <laughs> this beautiful, soft skin and red hair. And so there was the, the brunette, the blonde, and the redhead. And they all got gushied up. And the lady, they looked pretty good. 
And uh, there I was, I mean, I did my best. <laughs> I was with them. And we came around a corner, and whom do we meet face to face? But Rudolph Bing with the entire entourage. <laughs> the uh, assistant manager, the tour manager, blah, 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 right down to the choreographer. And I don't know where this came from, but I'm, I walked straight up to him and I said, Mr. Bean, can we ask you a favor? And he said, yes. <laughs> and you have this long Austrian uh, accent and looked down his nose at me. And I, I told him, and I, told, I don't remember when I said, but I told him why we wanted to go. And uh, he said, is this very important? To you. And I said, I don't know where this came from. I said, it's the most important thing in my life. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> and um, so this lascivious eye went over this, the blonde. And, the, and he said, well, of course you must go. <laughs> <laughs> well, the choreographer fell off in that moment. But we had permission with witnesses. <laughs> So, okay, time came, that day came. Oh, well, like we no more than achieved that, you know, monumental task, then Baba sent word that you can't come on Saturday, you have to come on Friday. Oh. Well, I knew perfectly well that there was no way that we could go to Rudolph Bing and ask him to change that. I mean, uh, I did not know how practical Baba was at that time, and Baba was. If anything, he was practical. But I believe that he would have agreed that you just can't push your luck that far. So I got in touch with Miss Kresk somehow or other. Baba was already here, and she was with him. I don't remember all the details. It was 50-something years ago, 50 years ago. But anyway, she said, well, I'll see what I can do. So anyway, she did, and uh, she got in touch with me, and she said, Baba said, yes, he will see you on Saturday as originally planned, but you must be there before five in the afternoon. Okay. So, oh, well, we thought, well, I thought, oh, that's great, because, you know, we have this hot plane hired, and we're going to go to Myrtle Beach, and we're going to see Baba and come back on the same day. Right? And meet the company, which was meet, moving from Minneapolis to uh, Bloomington, Indiana, while we were gone, because we didn't have a performance that day. Had we had a performance, we'd never been able to go. So we, you know, oh, no, no problem. Right? Well, the day dawned, I guess, I would never know it, because we got up at like four in the morning, and my task was that I was going to get a cab, and we were at the University of uh, Minnesota, and billeted in different places, different dorms, and I was going to get a cab and go and pick up each of the girls. Well, I walked out and couldn't believe my eyes. Uh, there was a fog, like you could hardly see your hand in front of your face. Like you just wouldn't believe, and I thought, how did this happen? And I went trudging through the snow because it was after all Minnesota, there was only May. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, don't you know, a cab came along. And I, he said, Where are you going? And I told him, Well, we're going to such and such a private airport. And he <laughs> and drove off. <laughs> and, um, so, and then, but another cab came. And I asked him, and you know, where are you going? And I said, well, we're going. And he said, well, you're not going anywhere. And I said, will you take us to the airport? And he said, well, why not? I'm not going to get any other fares anyway. So he did. And the way we got to the airport was for me to stick my head out the window and look at the shoulder of the room <laughs> and see the, where the lights hit and tell him to the left of it. And we crawled <laughs> to that little airport. And we got to the airport, and sure must, there was a man in attendance in a little hut, and he was absolutely shocked to see us. And he said, 
we don't expect to go anywhere, do you? And I said, well, we're, we said, we're, we're going to try. And he said, well, yeah, you know, <laughs> sit down and make us any cake, coffee, and so forth and so on. And we waited and we waited and we waited for our plane to arrive. And finally, Skipper and I decided we would take a little stroll in the fresh air. <laughs> Thick, you know, <laughs> take a drink, so. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> Anyway, we're walking around, and all of a sudden, uh, Skipper stopped Dan Coe. And I'm looking at her, and what happened? She didn't say, and she's staring into it. And this man materialized out of the mist. <laughs> that man was our pilot. <laughs> he had landed that plane, oh and I hadn't heard it. <laughs> and in those days, I could hear. I mean, uh, I didn't. <laughs> but anyway, then he announced to us, he said, you know, uh, I came because, you know, you have your money down. We had paid our full, you know, I forgot how much it was, but it was more than $800. And um, he said, I came because I can fly on the instruments if I fly by myself. So I came up here on instruments, but if I have passengers, the law says I cannot fly on instruments. I have to go by visual uh, navigation. <laughs> In that fall? <laughs> well, anyway, he said, but he said, do um, you want to try? And he said, yeah. <laughs> so, we got to, so we got to Chicago, hours and hours and hours late already. So I said, well, I better send a telegram. Now, mind you, the only information I had about the center in those days was the post office box number. I didn't know tell you know they had telephones in South Carolina. <laughs> uh, so uh, anyway, I sent a telegram to that and I said, we are delayed because of poor weather. Something to that effect. And um, I was so because they were expecting us at something like eleven o'clock in the morning. And um, okay. So, uh, this man who was named Warren E. By, I don't think I'll ever forget that name, because he came to Chicago, we got to Chicago, and he came out with a rather grim face and he said, uh, uh, they don't want us to take off. And this was a man, I decided that he just didn't like to hear, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so he said, shall we try? <laughs> uh, we flew and we flew and we flew. And what can I tell you? We landed five times. Circumnavigating storms, we had to land and take on new gas. And uh, I thought it was three times, but when Miss Crest died, I'm done taking a tangent here, but um, I was going through her things and I came across a letter that I had written to her in 1952 and it was right after we had met up. And she had kept that letter. Miss Crash was not <laughs> sentimental. <laughs> but she had kept that letter uh, since 1952. And in it I realized that well, we had landed five times. Anyway, and the last time, um, well, the fourth time, landed. It was, we were landing in Louisville, and the weather just, ooh, it was awful. You know, the rain was practically horizontal, and though, though there was no wind, it was just this terrible rain, and dismal, dismal weather. And every time we landed, Mr. Bai would go into the control tower and spend some time and come back and say, you know, we're having trouble, this and that and the other, and we got to the point where we didn't say anything, we would just look at him <laughs> and every single time he managed, some way or another, to finagle permission to take off. And we got to Louisville, and he came out with a very different look on his face, and he said, they won't let us go. Well, we didn't say anything, and then he looked at these broads, you know, his, Lookers, he went back and he came back and he said, Get my plane. <laughs> and we, I mean, I knew it was go our buzz because I knew we didn't have permission to take off. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel we didn't. By the way, he said, Well, we, 
All right, so we fly and we fly and we fly. And then, then he said, in the middle of this, he, I was in the back seat, and Skipper was in the front. We used to take turns. Those of us, there were three people in the back seat and two in the front with the pilot. And this plane was, I mean, it was a flying orange crate, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> He said, open the glove compartment and look for map number something or other. So she does it. He said, you know, she unfolded this map and I held one in it and she the huge thing. And he said, look for eight, around age 17. You know, so I said, well, here's age. And she said, well, here's 17. So we looked. And he, she, he said, have you got that? And she said, yes. And he said, now you look for something or other. And I forgot about it. He said, and she said, she, she looked. And she found it, and he said, is that to the right or the, to the left of something? And she, <laughs> and she said, well, it's to the left. And in the midst, I said, he, we're lost. <laughs> and we were. But he found out, you know, with this and that and the other, and throwing that and that, and he said, I'm sorry, we're out of gas. <laughs> and we landed in Louisville. <laughs> but by this time, it was very late in the day, and the weather was easing up, and we were allowed to take off, and I think it must have been around five o'clock exactly, when, and I got to think, I said, we're not going to see him, we're, you know, we've done all this song and dance, and we're not going to see him, because I knew that father kept his word about, if you're supposed to be there, I don't know why I knew that, that you're supposed to be there, and if you're not there, that's just your tough luck. And, um, but, uh, and Mr. Vi, whom, uh, when we were in Louisville, he said, you know, you're not going to get there. Do you want to go on? And we said, might as well. He said, might as well. I'm, I'm hired to take you there. <laughs> and so he got it. And, um, and father thought, well, I swear, it was the most, I was in the front seat this time. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, the clouds parted like the, you know, Christ parting the Red Sea. <laughs> and the whole world was bathed in this golden light, having been bathed, washed very well all day long. And I thought, uh, you know, it was like you could almost hear the music, and, uh, <laughs> uh, but we were not going to be able to see Baba. It was already five o'clock. Well, we got to Myrtle Beach, and I think it was eight o'clock at night. Yeah. I do not. I remember it was dark because I got out of the plane and uh, went running to the uh, <laughs> administration building and tripped over a fence oh, because yeah. I didn't. It was a little low fence. But anyway, we had been instructed to then contact a Mrs. Houston at the Lafayette Manor Hotel, that she was our contact. So I called her and this hysterical, well, I said, this is Tex Hightower speaking. Well, she screamed and she was hysterical on the other end of the line. <laughs> she said, where are you, where are you? And I said, well, we're in Myrtle Beach. And she gathered herself together. She said, well, I have a message from Mama. And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, you're to come here, and you're to spend the night here at the hotel. And Baba will see you at 7 in the morning. Aww. Now, really and truly, I did not expect that. So, okay, well, I don't know what kind of a night I expect. But the Lafayette Manor Hotel was fantastic. It was right out of Tennessee Williams. It was a square frame building. Two floors, high, two floors high, and the ceilings were like 20 feet high, and the windows went from floor to top, and a little bit, more than a little dilapidated, you know, past the beauty, and it had a veranda all the way around on both floors. It was magical. And um, a staircase that was obviously made for hoof skirts. It was bad. <laughs> uh, but okay, and Mrs. Houston was rather charming when she gather her beads and um, <laughs> so anyway uh, come seven o'clock in the morning we sabrosh that was the only time I ever 
met Sam Roach. He, he came to pick us up in the car, and we drove uh, that at that time a beautiful drive from Myrtle Beach proper <laughs> to the center. And um, then we went inside the center, and the minute we got inside the center, a strange thing happened to me. I wasn't unaware of it until later, but what happened was, I became aware of silence, but silence. And I discovered that silence is not only the absence of sound, it is the presence of silence. And uh, I didn't hear the motor, I didn't hear the birds singing, I didn't hear the <clears throat> gravel on the, on the road or anything like that. And uh, uh, it was very odd. And of course, by this time, I'd like to remind you, you know, I didn't want to be there in the first place. I was a little bit tense. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we got to, to the original kitchen. The, the center was a little bit different, and you know, they there was this circle, and everything was around that circle. And we drove up, and we drove up in front of the original kitchen, and I was in the front seat, and I got out, and I came nose to breastbone with Rana, who looked down at me like, oh, the Arctic funnel, and said, you could have sent a telegram. And I said, oh, I'm not sending a telegram, what's the matter with her? And then, <laughs> and then she sort of stalked off. And I'll tell you later what that's all about. And then, uh, uh, I guess it was Delia came up. And she said, uh, she was taking us around to the, not the side entrance of the original kitchen, but the other entrance. And I did a little <laughs> of, the, of, of the room, and by the time, <laughs> we got to the door, Kitty met us at the door, and she said, It doesn't matter how you take Baba, just as long as you take him. <laughs> well, first of all, you know, Rago had treated me like a leper, and then this woman says to be something out of like that, right off the wall. <laughs> Anyway, and so at, the, at that time there was a, that, you know, uh, those of you who know the center, there's the original kitchen and then they added an addition, but there's a little bricked in patio in between. Well, in the old days, the new kitchen wasn't there, and this just was a little bricked in patio. And there was a little bench sitting right there, and this bench you could look and you could see the lagoon cabin. And the lagoon had the lagoon, lagoon cabin had a front door that I considered the front door, which opened towards the lagoon, and a side door that opened on towards the center. Well, Delia came, and she took Zebra. I mean, we sat down, you know, <laughs> Zebra, Sura, Skipper, and me, you know. Anyway. And it's, first of all, 7 o'clock in the morning, and I'm not a morning person anyway, but hey, <laughs> aside from that. So I watch, and Zebra goes in the front door, and I don't know how long it was, but all of a sudden she explodes out the side door in hysterical sobs. And I go, oh. <laughs> 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 Of course, I um, Because Zebra is a very emotional type. <laughs> oh, okay. So then the statuesque blonde in the, in the form of Sura goes in. And I'm looking rather intently by this time. And the same thing happens off. And she goes off, you know, to her. And she goes off wandering in, wandering in another direction. And then Skipper, whom I considered at the time the most sophisticated one of all of us. I don't know if she was or not, but I considered her so. Uh, it was her turn. And I looked at her there. I was really, I was going to see what happened there. <laughs> well, what can I tell you? She came staggering out the side door and walked straight into a tree. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, by this time, the hackles on the back of my neck. <laughs> And Delia came to me, and 
and I just sat there, and she, she took my hand, and I just sat there, and she made a little tug, and I thought, well, don't be rude. So I got up, and I followed Delia, and we went along that little path, and when we turned the corner, that the little path that led right up to the lagoon cabin, I saw something, uh, there was a screen door, and I saw something white pass, and I knew that was Baba, and by it. I dropped my head. I didn't drop my eye. I dropped my head pressed again. And I stumbled up that path and got into the cabin and I knew that Baba was standing there. But I didn't see him. <laughs> and then a strange thing happened. Uh, this was not a mystical experience, please understand. But the best way I can describe it, it was almost a physical experience. I was standing in a mummy case of clay, all completely covered. And suddenly, this mummy case began to crack. And it cracked very slowly, and it came between my toes and my ankle, and up my knees, and cracked this way, and over my head, and down the back. And when it got to the bottom, it fell to the side. And I stepped out of it. At which point I lifted my eyes and looked at Baba's face. And Baba opened his arms to me and bowed. He embraced me. Mind you, I didn't know that I had any feeling for Baba. But Baba embraced me with such a power of love. I mean, everything was in that embrace. Uh, it was tender, and it was sweet, but it was so powerful. And uh, I feel that he gave me enough love for about five or six lifetimes. And it was a total surprise. I didn't have any idea that love like that existed. And, uh, and I looked into Baba's eyes, and Leatrice put it very well. I will never forget, first of all, you've never seen anything that beautiful. I can promise you. I don't know what you've seen, but you've never seen anything that beautiful. His eyes were a dark, dark brown. And you looked into them and they went on and on and on and on. And um, 30 or 40 years later, I realized something that had been in my mind at that moment. That, mind you, it didn't last, but it was that moment I realized that absolutely everything that happens to me or around me or in the world is exactly the way it's supposed to be. Now that's a strange realization. And as I say, it didn't stick. And I didn't become aware of it for many, 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 many years later. So many, many years later. Okay. Now, from somewhere in the back of my head, there I was overwhelmed with, you know, generosity is much too mild a word, but I don't know what else to say. That the generosity of it of his giving me that love. And the first thing Baba said was, Baba is happy. And I was flattened by the fact that his giving made him happy. You know, and what he gave me, immeasurable, you know, uh, un, uh, undescribable and everything else, that was, you know, it was just uh, amazing that, uh, astounding that somebody would do something like that and then say that made him happy. So he sat me down, and in the old days, uh, I really don't like the lagoon cabin anymore. <laughs> I think it looks like a motel room. Uh, with a sofa and this and that and the other. In those days, there was nothing in there. There was just Baba's chair, a little table with a vase of flowers on it, and a bench uh, on the side door, by the side door, and a bench by the um, uh, uh, front door. That's correct, isn't it, Adele? There was nothing else in there. No, he was sitting in a chair. It was a chair when I saw him. No, it was a chair. No, dear. I mean, you saw him the day before. I saw him and it was a chair. 
gentle dog like that. <laughs> anyway, so he sat me down on that little bench. And um, he sat me there, and then we went to the opposite side. And that was the only time I ever saw Baba, when, when he was in good health. Because, you know, he had the uh, accident immediately after, and ever after that, uh, you know, something was wrong. But I saw Baba, first of all, his hair was down. And Baba was beautiful with his hair braided. But with his hair down, when I tell you something, Baba was beautiful. <laughs> I mean, you don't know how beautiful he was. And there's no way really that I can tell you how beautiful he was because nothing and no one is like him. He was unique. And he, uh, and his skin, I remember it is sort of honey color. And it was almost as if there was a light underneath his skin. And uh, and he was on the opposite. There was a little window over there. And he was on the opposite wall. And I saw him walk. He strode up and down. On the, and his hands were behind his back. And they were doing this as they often. But the only thing, you know, there's that movie from Nasik in 1936. Yeah. And uh, towards the end of the movie where Bob was walking across the field, but you get an idea. Did you notice the other people? They're running. Yeah. And Bob is walking with that beautiful stride. There was never a stride like that. There was never rhythm like that. And there he was. And he stayed, he walked up and down for some time. I don't know how long it was. And then he took. There was a, a little stool. He took a little stool and sat knee, almost knee to knee with me. And he said, I, I love you more than you will, I don't know, you can know or ever will know, something like that. And I, ordinarily, I would tell him, yeah, but I didn't because he had inverse me. Mm -hmm. And, um, okay. So then, he, um, he sent me away. And I went wandering off, and I wandered down by the lagoon. Was there anybody in the room other than... Uh, Rano and Delia. And Rano was reading the alphabet board. And she apologized, because she couldn't read it very well. Usually one of the men read it. And of course, I was amazed at it, you know, the way he did it anyway. And there was a funny thing that, um, <laughs> and Delia told the story of her stuff, that she was crying. <laughs> I mean, I didn't cry. Oh, and I forgot to tell you that. Well, you wouldn't know how difficult it would be for me to say to someone, I love you. But, and also, to someone about whom I didn't think I had any feeling for at all. But when he said, I love you more, and, and, uh, and I said, I love you too, Robert. And I do not know where that came from. But I do remember it, it sounded that about this big, <laughs> you know, compared to him that, that I said it. And uh, Dina was crying, and Baba looked at him and said, what are you crying about? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so then he sent me away. And, uh, and you know, I'm always saying Baba said this and that and the other. And I want to tell you that I never heard Baba's voice, but Baba was never silent to me. I don't think he was silent to anyone. I never heard it. And uh, uh, you know, whoever was translating, it was like Baba was saying it. And that, uh, but anyway. And I'm wandering off down there, and all of it, I don't know how long I was there, but a rather exasperated Saroche comes panting up to me and he said, I have a message for you. And he said, he said, Baba said to tell you that he knows how much you love him. I don't know what to make of that. I didn't care because I knew it was true and it didn't matter. And to this day I don't know how much, you know, how little, how much. But he knows how much and I'm willing to accept it. And fine, and then he went away. And, and then I took a new turn, and I decided wandering through the woods. <laughs> and a little while later, Sabros comes panting up again. He says, I have this message for you. And you do the same thing. Well, tell me how much you love. Okay, and then 
he called all of us back into the uh, into the lagoon cabin. And we sat again, we sat on this bench in the same order. And Baba did a rather odd thing. He didn't say anything, and he stood in front of Zebra for quite some time. And then he just stepped over and he stood in front of Sula. And he stood in front of um, Skipper and me. And then he sat down on that little stool in front of us and said, I was with you in the plane yesterday. Now, you must take me back with you. Aww. Okay. And uh, basically, he sent us away. Now, this was a beautiful day. I mean, a beautiful day at the center. It's early and the sun is shining and, you know, the blue dew is sparkling and everything like that. And Mr. Bai, our pilot, was waiting for us because he was going to fly us to um, uh, Bloomington, right? So we could do the performance that evening. Huh. Well, what can I tell you? We got into the plane and the clouds came over. <laughs> and we flew and we flew and we flew and so forth and so forth. And what can I tell you? We were grounded in a load of gold. <laughs> and they were ready for us this time. And we couldn't get away. So we were desperate because the time was, you know, that was early in the morning and the performance is at 8 o'clock at night and yet we were getting home. So I said, we can rent a car because, you know, Olivia was not all that far from the And uh, so we rented a car and Mr. Bai said, uh, you a good driver? And I said, well, I can drive. And he said, well, I'm a pretty good driver. You want me to drive you? And I said, do you want to do that? And he said, I am paid to get you to do <laughs> Um, this guy, this guy was not only a fabulous driver, he thought he was flying a plane. <laughs> we went on those country back roads, I mean, in this terrible weather home. But he wasn't quite fast enough because we got to the, uh, I don't know, he must have had radar because uh, I don't know whether he knew, I don't, I don't remember, but uh, coming into Bloomington, okay, well, we're not in the town square, right? We're in a theater someplace. And, uh, but anyway, he found it, and we got there just in time for the curtain to come down on the second act of Aida. And the second act of Aida has the triumphal scene, which is the big production number with the full company and all of the dancers and this and that and the other. And we had just missed it. And I had an understudy, of course, and each of these girls were principled in that they led on big groups of girls. The company, the dancers, there were 36 people which was a large company. And um, one, uh, well, uh, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> the, the performance was chaos. Because <laughs> the girls who were understudying them, the girls who were leading off the <laughs> one group of girls went the wrong room, wing and ran into the group that was coming <laughs> And the guy who, part, I am a partner of the ballerina, and he dropped her. Uh, he dropped her from here. Oh, no. yeah. And the thing is, the music So it was not a great dance performance. Okay. Well, we run into the backstage, and whom do we run <laughs> Mind you that Mr. Bing was some sort of demigod and didn't hang around in the filthy environs of backstage, but there he was. And I went up to him and I said, Mr. Bing, I'm awfully sorry, you know, but the weather, he was frigid and he said, you knew this could happen. <laughs> and I said, well, yes, sir, but you let us go. <laughs> 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 I was always very good <laughs> uh, But it was true. Well, it turned out that the, the company had been hysterical because the weather had been so terrible. It was like the worst weather in 20 years. 
and they didn't know what happened to us, and they hadn't heard from us, and we were not back when we were supposed to be back, and they were just so relieved to see us that we were uh, alive. And then, like, 25 years later, I learned that the reason Rano greeted me with that <laughs> frigidity was because Apparently that day when we were in the air, Baba made everybody who's, who was on the center, they made their lives miserable. Now that, that, that was the day that he had sent the group of men disciples, and Miss Crask also went with Elizabeth, and Miss Crask had left for the West Coast. They were on their way to pray Gopalama that day. So only a few of them were left, I know Rano and Kitty and uh, Delia and Sarosh and I don't know who else. Elizabeth was still there because she drove she, most of the Oh, okay, that, yeah, that would make sense. Right. Huh? Not in America. Well, anyway, I don't know. But anyway, he made their lives miserable because he, oh yes, of course Elizabeth was there because she told me the story <laughs> that he called her in. And he said, Elizabeth, who was an aviatrix, by the way, did you know that? No. Yeah, and she was apparently quite an adventurous one. Didn't she fly over the North Pole or something like that? Yeah. Anyway, he called her in and he said, Elizabeth, is this very bad weather for flying? And she said, well, Bob, it can't be any worse. And he said, well, tell me, do you think they've gone down? Oh. And she said, well, I don't know, Bob. And he said, you go and you check on the weather report. Well, Elizabeth, being Elizabeth, called Washington. <laughs> and got this detailed oh my God. Uh, uh, weather analysis, which well, said that it couldn't be worse, you know. And nothing was in the air but flies and mosquitoes. And uh, uh, he said, he made Kitty, I think, she had to go to the uh, kitchen. He said, go make them something to eat. They'll be hungry when they come. And she made sandwiches. And he sent Sarosh to the airport with these sandwiches. And of course, we were not there. And he came back. And he did that three times. And they had to throw out the old sandwiches and make new sandwiches. Yeah. Because fresh sandwiches, we would be hungry. And this. So that was why <laughs> um, Ronald said, uh, you could have sent a telegram. And um, <laughs> apparently they were really made quite uncomfortable. But they were sports enough. And also another very sweet thing happened. I have used many, well, 30 years later, at least, well, 25 years later, came to New York selling books and um, said no. She was with Baba that evening when we arrived. And he was staying in the guest house. And, um, that he, he had already, apparently he, he tied a handkerchief around his head before he retired at night. I didn't know that, but she said he did. And that she was with him when, he, when they were taking a little walk in that little compound. And someone came to him and told him that um, we had arrived. And he looked at Ivy and said, I wasn't going to work tomorrow, but I cannot resist love, and he tatted the pocket that he had our telegram in. Oh. So, so that's the story of how I came to Baba. Oh. So, okay, well, after that, I was really, uh, as Miss Crash put it, I was right, quite knocked off my perch. <laughs> and uh, apparently she told Baba that. She said, Baba, you've knocked that boy right off his perch. <laughs> because after we came back, 
uh, after the tour, the tour was over and so forth, and she was still with Baba, and Baba had had the accident, and um, so forth and so on. And I had made her, uh, I had signed a contract. I went right into rehearsal for another show. I went into a rehearsal for the opening of the John Beach Theater. I was jumping to Long Island, Blue Rock. Now that was a job. But anyway, so rehearsal times are not easy at any rate. But all I could think about, and I was, I had a reputation. I was a very disciplined dancer. I was a very quick study, and I was very conscientious, and so forth and so on. And that's true. Uh, but boy, all I could think about was Baba. And uh, all I really wanted to do in life. And I was very ambitious. Come on already, I was a dancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted fame, fortune, glamour, and admiration. What do you want? And, uh, uh, but I just didn't, all I wanted to be was close to Baba. So we were forbidden to communicate with Baba. But I wasn't forbidden to communicate with Miss Kresk. But when I, so I wrote to her daily, you know, and this, I don't know what I said. But it was only later that she told me that her job was to massage Baba's good legs and keep the circulation going and so forth. She's very good. Miss Crash just knew about everything about the human body, and uh, which made her a genius of teacher. But uh, I did not know that she was uh, with him and intimately with him all that time. And um, like, I don't know, many, many, many weeks later, she wrote me a little, she never responded to my letter daily. She wrote me a little note. She said, I have a message for you. <laughs> and to just show you just how really sweet Mother was, he said, tell that boy his messages of love will make me strong again. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> So, uh, and, and along this time, I said, Miss Chris, what am I going to do? I mean, I can't do anything. And she said, well, why don't you make him something? Oh, okay. Um, I, you know, I'm fair, I'm fair, I thought I was fairly <laughs> manually dexterous. And I thought, and I thought, and I thought, and I started, I said, I'll make him a box. And I'll carve him a beautiful box. And I got him. Gorgeous hunk of walnut, and I start carving, and I had it all designed that there was a lizard on one side and crawling over the top. And I started blocking, and I said, Wait a minute, you know how to use a box. What are you going to do with a box? And Mr. Crash said, Make him something and give it to him, but be prepared that he'll give it away right away. And I said, And then somebody would say, Who, who the heck did in this crazy box? <laughs> So I decided, oh, I'll make him something that maybe he won't give away. I'll make him a coat. So, I mean, I could sew. Both my uh, parents, they didn't actually teach me, but I grew up around sewing. My father was a tailor, my mother was a very good sewer, so. so I made him, and I asked Mr. Christ, I said, what size is Baba? Because if you had told me he was 12 feet tall, I'd say, oh yeah. And if you told me he was three feet tall, I would say, sure. <laughs> because when I saw Baba, he could have, he was, you know, he was everything. He was anything. He could have been, I don't know, I knew he wasn't 12 feet tall, and I knew he wasn't four feet tall, but I didn't know how big he was. And she said, mm, he's about your size. But she was, in those days, I was thin and gracious. And uh, <laughs> so uh, I made him, I got a beautiful piece of white woolen gabardine. And I make him a very nice little coat with a, a navy collar and, uh, <clears throat> you know, pockets and everything like that. The style I had seen the photographs. And then, lo and behold, we were given the opportunity to see Bob. And I think it was something like exactly two months after I had seen him. July, wasn't it? Wasn't it July at Agadusa's apartment? Yeah. Yeah, hot. But anyway, we were given the opportunity to just come and see Baba again. So I had this coat, and uh, I went. I knew it was like wait, we'll look at her jeans. <laughs> but anyway, um, I just couldn't wait. I was like a junkie. I couldn't wait for another fix from Baba. After that first one, boy, oh boy, let me tell you, it would, it would addict anyone. 
And so there I went, and uh, I met Mr. Christ at the door of his room, and I introduced his apartment a mystery, hot and humid summer day. And you know how beautiful Mama was the first time. And she said, you're not to ask any questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. And I walked in, and um, it was almost something like somebody slapped me with a cold towel. Because what I saw was a man lying on the bed with his leg in a cast and his arm in a cast. Mm -hmm. His hair was down again, but it was streaming because he was perspiring. He was obviously very, very uncomfortable. He was in pain, the heat was bothering him, and he was sitting on his bed. And I just dropped the coat, and I flopped at the end of the bed. And he motioned to me rather dispassionately, and he said, sit down. And I sat down on the bed, and Mama was lying here, and I sat down this way on the bed. And he took my hand with his free hand, he took my left hand, and he took it and he pressed, and he looked out the window, and he pressed my hand about the strength of the and then I do not say it hurt, but the power and the strength of his pressing that hand against his chest was noticeable. And I don't know how long that was, but uh, then he said, he gave me a grape, and he, put it, uh, he picked up a grape, and I held out my hand, and he said, no. And I opened my mouth, and he put the grape in, and I, I had the grape. <laughs> and he looked at me with such power that I'm like, mm. <laughs> And then he said, leave. Now, when I, when I bit the grape, he told me to leave. Okay, well, he knocked me from cloud nine to the fifth basement with that. Uh, there I went in all high, you know, because, and I will say that being on cloud nine was not all that good, but at the same time, you're not going to make an awful lot of effort to come down. I mean, it wasn't easy to live in the world and rehearse with all that junky choreography and everything, uh, but uh, you know, there was this kind of, you know, euphoria about it and everything, and so, um, um, he knocked me into the basement, and whereas you may have not have been perfectly comfortable on cloud nine, you're going to crawl your way out of the basement. You're not going to stay down there. So forever after, I mean, this is only in my own mind, which is not the best, by the way, uh, that I just I was always grateful to him for doing that to me because it gave me some kind of balance with him. I thought because every time I saw him. I saw him in an entirely different way. And yet, I knew my friends very well, even though, do you know that those girls and I never discussed amongst ourselves what had happened with Baba? We never talked about it to this day. And now it happened on the bomb, and I don't even know what their reaction to Baba was. But anyway, uh, I know Zebra. She saw him again, and she was exactly the same. She was in tears for three days. And Sura was the same, and Skipper was the same. And yet I saw him in a very different light. And I can't tell you how or what. It certainly wasn't in a case of enlightenment or anything like that, but I saw him differently. And um, very startlingly differently in 1962. When all the times, you know, 52, 54, 56, and 58, it had been intensely personal, very, very personal with Baba, between him and me. And when I saw him in 1962, the Western men saw him in the morning, and boy, it was totally impersonal. This was business. Whatever Baba's job was, we just happened to be there as, you know, hired hands, and uh, it was totally impersonal. And I saw Baba in a strange way in 1962 because, uh, huh? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't get started on time, you know. Fifteen minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll cut that. 
back no, to the coast. No, I heard it. Okay. No, 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 okay. no. Well, you know, you all know about the big rain in uh, in '62. We all went in. You know, the sun was beating down mercilessly and everything, and we got in there in that very first day, and this drug, it's incredible. <laughs> Converse happened, and pandemonium broke loose. I don't know, some uh, very strange atmosphere in, uh, to me. I mean, um, thunderously powerful, uh, strong, and I would say almost ominous. To me, it was ominous. And, uh, People had uh, suddenly they broke all the rules and they were afraid they were not going to see Baba. And they, this mass of people rushed towards the natives. And uh, I don't know what happened. Uh, men, uh, of course, the Indian men who were trained, Zingo, they were right on, they were ready, they formed a chain around Baba. Uh, a patent panic couldn't have gotten through them, to Baba. But then the men, and the Western men, and the Indian men formed chains on the aisle. Anyway, okay, we'll go back to the code. So, um, after a few days after I met Baba, and he had sent me down to the basement and so forth and so on, very early in the morning, like 6.30 in the morning, which is midnight to me, uh, the phone rang and this strange voice, which happened to be Miss Krask. I knew her very well, but this voice I had never heard before. And she said, I have a message for you from Baba. And my blood ran cold the way she said it. I don't know why, but anyway, she said, Baba said to tell that boy that when Baba needs a new coat, he is to make it. No, he, I forgot the part. He said, tell that boy he's put his head into a noose. <laughs> That's what it was. Now, mind you, I know I knew what that means. And that didn't frighten me or anything like that because I didn't know what it meant. Could be a noose of love, couldn't it? Yes, yes, yes. Just a minute. It could also be a noose that you're going to hang yourself with. Uh -huh. Couldn't it? Yeah, it could. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, and then he said, when Baba needs a new coat, he is to make it, but he is not to work on it until I tell him to. Okay. So years pass. And 1956 comes along. And 1956, uh, in 1952, I had made Baba a disastrous pair of sandals. <laughs> Disastrous. But, uh, anyway, so I said, I'm going to put that right. I'm going to make him another pair of sandals. So I started him a pair of evening sandals <laughs> on a black slave with cut out and gold embroidery and red leather underneath. So the red came through the gold and the black. Now, <laughs> can't you see Bob? <laughs> and they were thong sandals besides. He didn't, I never saw him, but I don't know. Maybe he wore them, you know, with the, between the toe and So I started those sandals, and I hadn't finished them. And we got down to Myrtle Beach. I have to abbreviate this because they're going to throw me out. They're going to get out. Anyway, uh, uh, and we get down to Myrtle Beach, and of course, don't ask me what we did, but we never had any time. We never had any time. We were waiting to see Baba, and Baba would send for you, and you had to be there. And zip, zip. You had to be there in no time flat. And yet, I had to finish these sandals. I was not going to give him these sandals, so um, I would go to the original. I was staying in the far cabin and uh, with Donald Stevens and Peter Saul. And um, <laughs> that's when Donald Stevens tried to get me to read to you God Speaks every morning. <laughs> that's when they stopped the morning. <laughs> but it didn't work. <laughs> so I would go to the uh, original kitchen, and I would work on the sandals at night, you know, and stupid me. You know, I used glue, and when you use the glue, you, you hammer the glue to hammer out all the bubbles. And I had a tiny little toy hammer, literally a toy, a child's toy, I mean, about this long, and I would tap, tap, tap. And it never occurred to me, boy, bright that I am, that you know, sound carries over water. <laughs> well, everybody knew I was making these sandals. And I met Jean, <laughs> Leatrice's mother in the path. <laughs> One morning she said, we heard the fairy cobbler last <laughs> Somebody come knocking on the far cabin and said, Bob, 
God wants to see you. And so I threw on some clothes and I went there. My mom, it was very early and the center was absolutely ravishing and beautiful and golden with, you know, the, the, the flowers were like the songs of the bird. They were just so vibrant. And anyway, Mama was sitting on this little railing that <clears throat> went around the center, and upon which we were forbidden to sit, because that's where the chiggers lived. But anyway, Mama was sitting there, and he came, he said, sit down, Ted. He said, sit down, Ted. So I sat down next to Mama, and he said to me, he said, isn't this beautiful text? And I said, oh, Mama, it really is. And he said, look at that. And he pointed to uh, a sort of a frame where the trees and the vegetation, and there was a little knoll. And that little knoll is where the farm shed is now built. But it was across the lagoon, and he said, Isn't that you? And I said, Oh, yes. And then he said, Make the coat. <laughs> and I never fell on that. And I said, Oh, and this is the case where I said, Oh, I'm not to finish the sandals. The minute I said that, I said, You shouldn't have said that. And boy, I wish I hadn't. But anyway, he said, what sandals? And I said, well, you know, I thought, and he said, hmm. And he looked very serious, and he said, okay, finish them. Well, by this time, I had discarded the idea of evening slippers. <laughs> and I was making a pair of practical sandals. Well, I mean, I will abbreviate all of this. But he said at that time, they have to be ready by Wednesday. It was now Sunday. They, and so, okay, and that's when I really stayed up all night and so forth and so on. And I made them, and I finished them, and I knew they were not right. But I finished them, they had to be a friend right Wednesday, and there was no one. So and I tucked them in my back pocket, in a bag, brown paper bag. Well, come Wednesday, he doesn't say a word. Thursday, Friday, and Sunday, he ignores them completely. And then we go to the Brook Green Gardens, whatever day that was, and we go over there, and we're wandering around the place, and um, there's this huge crowd of people, and um, who am I talking about people, and how they managed to get to Siva? I'll tell you how they managed, it was called elbows. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that Billy Eaton has the sharpest elbow in the world, because I have been knocked flat. But, so I gave that up. I said, this is nonsense, you know, I'm going to stay on the fringes. And Peter and I were always on the fringes. The people were rushing around. Being, and, and I never knew what was going on in the front. Never. I didn't care, frankly. And um, we were with Bob. And all of a sudden, everybody stops in the thing. Like dominoes, you know, we all smack into one another. <laughs> and, um, and there for some time, and we're wondering what's happening. And all of a sudden, the crowd parts, and all these heads turn. And Bob is sitting under a tree, and he said, and he looked at me, and he said, come here. And I came, and he said, give me the sandals. And I had them in my back pocket. And I gave them to him, and another disaster. They did not fit. That was the one kind thing the Sufis did to me. They were, it was in a movie, and he was trying to walk with them, but they cut it out. <laughs> I mean, he couldn't walk in them. And so, okay, so then I'm free to make the coat, right? But I didn't have scissors, I didn't have fabric, and we were down in Myrtle Beach, and we were forbidden to leave the center. So I had to go to Baba, and I did not like this. I said, Baba, I asked to see him, and he, uh, I was given permission, I said, may I go into town, <laughs> town uh, and uh, buy some fabric to make your coat? And he, very, very serious. I mean, this one didn't bode any good. And he said, okay, go ahead. Well, I went into Myrtle Beach. And, of course, they had beautiful cottons. I will say that. But I didn't want to make a coat by hand with cotton. He, I never saw him in a cotton coat. But I bought a beautiful piece of cotton, blue cotton. And I bought scissors and I bought thread and so forth and so on, all the pins and all the things I would need. And then I, but I never cut the cotton because I didn't want to make it out of cotton. I don't know why. And then suddenly we leave Myrtle Beach, we go to Washington, we go from Washington to Los Angeles, from Los An Angeles to um, Ojai and back, and there's no time for anything. 
and then we go to San Francisco. The day we arrived in San Francisco, uh, I don't care if I do run over time, I'm going to tell you the story, that the night before we went to San Francisco, I had a terrible night because we were in the Hollywood Roosevelt, Roosevelt Hotel. I think Bob was on the seventh floor, was he? Anyway, I was two floors below, whatever it was. And Peter Saul was in that bed, and I was in that, and there was a, an area in between. And that night, I was in that dreadful state that I'm sure we always all experience, where you're not asleep and you're not awake. Mm -hmm. And the reason that was because Baba was walking up and down the side of my bed. Now, mind you, I didn't see him. It was not a physical presence, but it was like, you know, in this state of stupor. He was walking up and pacing up and down and pacing up and down. And, um, and then, of course, we were supposed to be ready at 7 o'clock. And at 6 o'clock, bang, bang, bang on the door. Where are you? Bob is ready. He was always doing that. And he would say, well, it's, it's 7 o'clock my time. <laughs> and um, so anyway, so, and we all gathered down, uh, we were going to go to San Francisco and we um, went down to the lobby of the hotel and uh, we were waiting for transportation and Bob looked at me very, very casually and he said, uh, did you sleep well? And I said, and stupidly, you know, you're not going to complain to Bob about not sleeping in front of people. So I said, oh, I'm fine, Bob. He ignored it. And um, then uh, we got to the airport. All this came, and, you know, it went very smoothly, but still there were a lot of people, and there was a big schmigigi there. And uh, a big fuffle. And we get to the airport, and we're waiting for the plane. And again, I happened to be close to Bob, and very casually he looked at me, and he said, you slept well? And I said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yes, Bob, I slept fine. And OK. So we get into the air. And we're in the air, and Bunty and I are sitting in the bulkhead seats, and Baba is several rows behind. And I think it was Adi, Baba, and Merji in the three seats. And um, all of a sudden, Adi comes up to the front, and he said, Baba wants to see you. And I didn't like the tone of voice. <laughs> so I went back, and then Baba was not casual at all. He looked me straight in the eye, and he said, how did you sleep? <laughs> and I said, well, actually, Baba, I didn't sleep at all. <laughs> I had a and Baba beamed, and he reached across, took me under the arm, and lifted me right across Adi, and gave me this enormous embrace, and sent me away. Mm -hmm. Now, don't ask me what that was about, but if you get an embrace, don't worry about it. <laughs> and I went up, and I was sitting there, and Bunty said, what was that all about? And I said, well, I really don't know. He loved and so I started telling and she sort of got a funny look on her face. And I started to turn my head, and this hand came and pushed my head back into that, again, that, and I knew it was Baba then. I struggled for a second, and then I realized it was Baba and stopped. And I realized with that kind of strength that that was Baba. And he pushed my head back into the seat. And first, I don't know how long. And then, he went away, and I said to her, you know, I was stunned. And I said to Monty, what did he do? And she said, he didn't do anything, he just looked straight ahead. Oh. So that was a, another strange, strange thing that happened. Took mm -hmm. with Bob. Okay, then we get to San Francisco, and we get there, and Bob says, take the afternoon off. You can go into the city, you can do that. Aha! And I went, and I asked somebody, I said, where's the best fabric store? And they told me, and I went, and I got this beautiful, glorious English flannel, a light where it was like a cloud, and the most beautiful sky blue you ever saw. I don't know why I insisted Bob had to be in blue. He looked wonderful. So anyway, and I made this, and I stayed up, and then of course, he never gave you a chance. He never gave you any time. Believe me, there was never any time. And I remember distinctly that I am not a beach baby. And I don't give a damn about the water or swimming or the sun or anything like that. But we were having lunch and I thought, oh boy, this afternoon you're going to be able to work on that coat. And then he said, Baba came in and said, you're enjoying lunch? And I said, yes, yes. And he said, go to the pool and enjoy yourselves. Well, that happens to be an order. 
I had to go to the pool. And this, this coat is up there. And mind you, I bought silk thread. Uh, and it, because I learned it's strong and beautiful. And silk thread is very beautiful, but nothing knots like silk thread. And I was back stitching this whole coat with a flat fell seam. And those of you who do not know what a flat fell seam is, you stitch it three times. Whoa. And um, anyway, I made this coat and I stayed up for five nights in a row. And again, I had to make a request. We were going to go to the Lilliput Theater to see puppets with Baba. And I, again, I didn't want to do it, but I said, I asked to see him and I said, Baba, may I have permission to stay at home and um, work on the coat? And he looked at me and he said, you don't want to go to the theater with me? Oh. <laughs> uh, you know, that in I said, well, yes, Baba. And he said, all right, stay and work on the coat. Well, I worked on the coat, and I worked on the coat. And again, Jean Shaw comes into the picture because I was sitting with, um, uh, the, the, the dancers were working, uh, were sitting with um, Kitty, because Kitty saved all the fruit. Uh, when Baba met people, I think it was somebody who lived in San Francisco, would provide these beautiful fruits and flowers. And um, anyway, she would save all the fruit. <laughs> And the dancer would sneak in after the interviews, and we would eat all the fruit. So we were there in that little compound. There were these little stakes. Each uh, room had uh, these sort of pails uh, dividing them. And uh, I'm talking at that time. I had to take some breaks. And I said, you know, I don't know. I'm ready to put the hem in the sleeve, but I don't know how long they are. And I hear this voice, and I know. And I turned around, it's Jean Shaw. And I said, oh, you know how long? And I said, how do you know? And she said, well, I do the ironing. Oh. Adele did the washing, and she did the ironing. And I said, oh, okay. So I'm, now I'm terribly impressed, right? So I said, okay, so how long is it? And she took it, she took the garment on the arm, and it was just that. And I thought to myself, sure. Uh -huh. Well, I put a pin there, okay? I said, well, you don't know how long it is. She said, Ugh. her guess is as good as mine. So I mean, what can I do? It was perfect, zap, right there. But anyway, uh, Baba then started, uh, you know, embarrassing me in public by saying, oh, have you finished the coat? <laughs> Mind you, you hadn't given me one minute to work on it. But it ain't it, it got to be a, a running joke. That no, Texas not finished the coat. And Baba said, I know, when I'm flying away, you'll be running around. <laughs> well, that's just about the way it happened because uh, he was leaving the next morning and I had not finished that coat. And, I mean, there's an awful lot of stitching. And uh, so I stayed up, I didn't go to sleep to bed, and, uh, but I didn't have time to put pockets on. I had, I had it finished, but there were no pockets. And uh, I had to ask Baba permission. I said, Baba, when I finish, I'll be able to finish the coat. We were not permitted to go near Baba's room when he retired. So I said, may I just drop it on your doorstep? And again, he went through that thing of looking very, and he said, like, okay, put it there. So I finished it like five o'clock in the morning, and I put it on, and I drop it, and I leave it in front of Baba's room, doorstep. And I get back to the room, and I'm absolutely cross-eyed and valerian. And I think my head hit the pillow and there was a knock on the door. And <laughs> it was six o'clock. And said, Baba wants to see you. <laughs> so I threw on some clothes and I went charging around. And I just rounded the corner. And Baba's room, the door was open. And Baba was standing at the other side. But, but in, and I just turned, and I hit, and he was framed in the doorway. And he was standing there in that coat. And he said, don't I look handsome? <laughs> and I must say he really did. I, I say without humility or anything else that that coat looked gorgeous on him. And um, I, uh, uh, he wore that coat when he left Los Angeles. <laughs> and again, the Sufis did me a favor because they were filming all of that. 
And there was a, I saw it once, there was a, a shot of him at the airport, and he's yeah. going like yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> I was in it. But anyway, okay. But then I never, uh, never thought anything about it, and then many, 20 years later, there was a film from Australia, and um, a rather, you know, not a very good film, actually. <laughs> and, uh, but, then, like in the, you know, there's a shot of the plane and it comes in, the door open, and the, and so forth and so on, and Baba stepped out of the plane in that coat. Of course, he, <laughs> he had it on when he left in San Francisco. He had it on in Australia. So that's the story of the coat, and I'm not so terribly late. Yeah.